from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Check in San Francisco and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, TikTok is under fire over a challenge that involves cooking chicken with NyQuil. We're gonna have the details on the stunt that led to a warning from the FDA. Plus, Lara Hippo is looking for the next big thing. After closing $230 million in new funding, I'll talk to Eric Hippo about their next move. And first on Bloomberg, outgoing CEO of Kraken, Jesse Powell, talks about why he is stepping down. Also, we'll ask what he thinks about J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon calling crypto tokens decentralized Ponzi schemes. All of that in a moment, but first I want to get a look at the markets, and it is all about the Fed. As expected, the central bank raised rates 75 basis points. Stocks, including tech and most major digital currencies, swung between gains and losses. Joining us to break it all down are Ed Ludlow in New York. Ed, take it away. Yeah, it was a roller coaster afternoon, right? We got the 75 basis points hike as expected. The surprise and the more hawkish element of the afternoon was the forecast from officials on where rates go from here 4.3% by the end of the year, 4.6% in the terminal rate into 2023. And the market weighing up what the Fed is prepared to do in terms of fighting inflation and giving the economy some pain. And you look at those gyrations behind me or the NASDAQ 100, the tech heavy index, they were big swings between gains of more than 1%. Ultimately, we closed down 1.8%. On that equation of inflation fighting against pain, here is what Fed Chair Jay Powell had to say. There is a possibility to go to a certain level that we've, we're confident in and, and stay there for a time. Um, but we're not at that level. Clearly today, we're, you know, we're just, uh, we, we've just moved, I think, probably into the very, the very lowest level of what might be restrictive. And, and certainly in my view and in the view of the committee, there's, uh, there's uh, a ways to go. So we saw the same gyrations that we saw in equity markets go through to digital tokens like Bitcoin, which kind of hung out at a three-month low. Beyond that, there wasn't a lot of news driving specific stocks in the market. We saw pain from mega caps, Apple and Amazon, for example, the biggest points, laggards and drags on the Nasdaq 100. But interestingly, one company that did hold on to gains was NVIDIA. They've got their conference on at the moment. Analysts really bullish about their latest graphics trip, chip and a deal with Sept and LiDAR to develop a simulation suite for autonomous driving. At one point, Septon, which closed up 17.5%, was up 45%. But either way, that was its biggest jump since June. Em. All right, Ed, thanks. We'll see you a bit later in the show. Turning to the two big stories regarding TikTok, the FDA has issued a warning that a new TikTok challenge could be dangerous. The so-called sleepy chicken challenge is when people cook their chicken in NyQuil. Meantime, TikTok will ban fundraising and all other money-making opportunities for politicians and government accounts on the platform here to discuss. Bloomberg's Alex Barinka. Let's start with the challenge. How big did this one have to get for the FDA to weigh in? Uh, it, it got big enough for um, parents and folks to complain, uh, which is typically what happens with these companies. Um, the social platforms will play a little bit of whack-a-mole, um, searching down these challenges, these fads. We saw it with the really dangerous Tide Pod challenge of a few years ago on some of the other social platforms. But this one, Emily, um, the Sleepy Chicken Challenge, it does seem like TikTok has snuffed this one out. If you search for um, that term right now in the app, it sends you to a warning, basically, about dangerous challenges and dangerous fads. I will say uh, there are a lot of kind of um, scary type challenges, weird information that pops up on the platforms that doesn't always get folks like the FDA to get involved. So clearly this was one that they felt like they needed to jump in on. And Emily, I will say, you search for Sleepy Chicken, those posts have been taken down. You search for some names that are misspelled hmm. or you add a few letters in there and those words are still up, which I just think illustrates the challenge these platforms have when it comes to locking down on misinformation like this. 
Yeah, we found some of them, but decided not to show them to our viewers for obvious reasons. Um, in, in perhaps even bigger news, this decision on politicians and governments and not allowing them to make money on the platform. Can you explain uh, how this works? Sure, of course. TikTok came out today uh, basically with a, a pretty significant expansion of its ban on political ads, political content ahead of the U.S. midterms. In the, in the past, historically, TikTok has banned political advertisements from governments, from politicians. Now it's taking that a step further and saying these individuals also cannot fundraise. So there is no soliciting of campaign donations. Uh, there is no asking for money if you're a politician or you're a government or government entity. They also are banning these accounts from accessing any of the money-making tools on the platform. That can be things like tipping from users or gifting, uh, or things like the Creator Fund, which is a fund um, that pays out users with a lot of followers for the number of views and engagements they get on the app. So uh, you've heard this argument before, Emily, from TikTok. You heard TikTok's COO in front of a Senate panel make this argument last week. TikTok uh, likes to attest that they are an entertainment platform. They're not a place for politics. Some of these um, prohibitions and moderating of, the, of this type of content kind of backs that up. Um, but it is a very notable kind of piece of news, particularly in this election season. And as we start to get fired up about the next presidential election, which will come closely on the heels of the midterms this year. And quickly, how does this compare to what Meta, Instagram, you know, Twitter, have done in terms of their stance on you know, politicians making money? Absolutely. So TikTok um, and Twitter both have completely banned political ads. So there is no kind of money making there. On Meta's platform, Facebook and Instagram, those ads are still able to be up there. I've still seen content on those platforms soliciting donations. So it does seem like TikTok is taking a step further than some of its big tech peers. Um, but you know, as this evolves and social media platforms tend to exchange ideas, it'll be a place that I'll certainly be watching more closely, particularly if there's any uh, kind of dust ups with Facebook or Instagram in this election season. All right, Bloomberg's Alex Barinka, thank you very much. Okay, coming up, his firm just raised $230 million. Where will that money go in a downturn? Eric Hippo joins us next to talk about his big bets. This is Bloomberg. New York's top venture capital firms just announced plans to invest $230 million across a couple of funds at seed and earlier stages. Ben Lair is also back as a full-time investor. He co-founded the firm before becoming the CEO of Group 9 Media, which sold to Fox Media. Joining me now, Eric Hippo, managing partner at Lair Hippo. Eric, great to have you back with us. Curious what the fundraising environment was like for these two funds, given a very challenging macroeconomic backdrop. Uh, yes. Hi, Emily. Good to be with you. Uh, the, the majority of these new funds were, in fact, raised last year, uh, and uh, and you know we have we, this is our twelfth year. We're, we're, these are fund eight and select four, so early stage and late stage uh, number eight, late, uh, late stage number four. So we we uh, we've done quite well, and we have very loyal LPs. Uh, we've we've been able to capture some new LPs as well. So it hasn't been. Really, it's, it's, it hasn't been exceptionally hard. Um, I would imagine that today for new funds, it would be pretty difficult. So uh, how is the changing macro environment changing your strategy and where you're going to place your bets? So we, we are quite well known for our consumer companies, uh, companies like Bobby Parker and Casper and Alberts and Glossier and many others. Um, and but in the in the more recent years, we've also been very very focused on B two B on enterprise software. Uh, we're less known for that, uh, but we do over half of our investments in those areas, and and those are at the moment very exciting. And we're looking forward to kind of balancing our consumer business with our with our B two B business. Now. 
Venture capitalists are announcing big funds left and right, but it seems like there's not a lot of places to put this money. I mean, is there just a lot of dry powder sitting on the sidelines that's, you know, piling up, you know, while valuations come down and the economy resets? There is, there is a record amount of dry powder, as you say. Uh, what we're finding is that uh, funding at the, uh, the seed and pre-seed level, which is our specialty, uh, you know, continues and, and the normal normal pace. Series A as well is is um, you know we, our companies are getting funded at the Series A. But where things are uh, much slower is in the later stages, uh, Series B and beyond. And that's got to do with the fact that late stage investors um, are really not sure about how to price, how to value uh, companies. But that as soon as the market kind of settles in the later stage, uh, there will be plenty of money to be put to work. So are you waiting for valuations to come down? Is, is that sort of what I hear you saying? In, in where we invest at the seed, uh, valuations have moderated. They haven't yet come down to uh, kind of pre-2021 levels. Uh, but you know, we, we take the very long view. Uh, and so we invest in a, in a, in a good year and a bad year. You know, our companies are going to start maturing years down the road. Um, so we, um, you know, we, we, we find valuations to be more attractive today, for sure. But more importantly, we have more time to do our work. There isn't a frenzy that existed last year where people wanted to close their rounds in a matter of days. Now we're, we're back at being able to, uh, you know, close the round in a matter of weeks, giving us plenty of time to do our work and our due diligence. So what's your take on, you know, another meeting from the Fed, Rate hikes seem to be continuing. How is that impacting your outlook? The, the biggest impact uh, for you know, uh, venture capital at the moment, it has to do with the fact that, that the IPO market is, uh, is dead in the water. Um, and so our companies that wanted to go public this year are postponing uh, that particular event. And that always has an effect on the M&A market as well. If, if the IPO market is slow, the M&A market is slow as well. So, uh, you know, last year we saw a record uh, amount of liquidity. We returned uh, an absolute record of uh, uh, back to our limited partners. This year it's much slower. But again, we take the long view. You'll have a down year. You'll have an up year. It, it over a period of time, uh, it doesn't really matter. All right, uh, Eric Hippo of Laro Hippo. Always good to have you here, Eric. Thank you for Thank stopping you, by. All right, coming up, Kraken CEO Jesse Powell stepping down. What does it mean for the future of the crypto exchange? Our conversation with him coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Quick check of the markets again. I want to bring back our Ed Ludlow, who's been watching a few more things. Ed, what else is catching your eye right yeah. now? Yeah, I mean, there was just so much that happened on Wednesday afternoon. As a reminder, the Fed did raise rates by 75 basis points, and the hawkish surprise was where rates go from here. Officials saw 4.3% by the end of 2022, 4.6% terminal rate going into 2023 or in 2023. And behind me are some kind of the corners of the technology market, right? It was the mega caps and some of the US shares of Chinese listed tech companies that fell the most all told. Look at the NYSE Fang Plus index down 2.6%. And then we talk about why do we keep going on about interest rates and why every day do I stand in front of you and say rates are projected to do this? Because higher rates discount the present value of future profits. For a lot of these tech companies, including the meme stocks, including the non-profitable uh, corners of the tech market, they haven't got any profit anyway. They're trading at very high multiples. So that was an area of the market that we looked to. A really interesting part of the market as well Wednesday was aerospace and defense. You heard 
President Putin of Russia talking about mobilizing troops and talk about annexation of certain parts of Ukraine. Of course, that war ongoing. At first, defensive and aerospace stocks have been much, much higher, but actually post-Fed paired their gains to be to a decline of 9%. Some breaking headlines crossing the Bloomberg terminal in the last few minutes from Salesforce, one of the companies you and I do discuss more often, M, which is up now 3% in after hours. The company saying it has a full year 2026 revenue target of $50 billion. Why does that matter? Well, to give you some context, in full year 21, Salesforce had revenue of around $35 billion. So as part of their Investor Day presentation in the Bay Area, in San Francisco on Wednesday, they've been telling investors kind of what their longer term expectations are. And that expectation is to boost rev re revenue on a full year basis in a very meaningful way to have $50 billion of sales by full year 26. And I know over the coming days and weeks, we'll keep a close eye on that stock, Ed. Absolutely. I'm actually interviewing Salesforce co-CEO Mark Benioff tomorrow at Dreamforce. We're going to get his thoughts on the market moves and his broader outlook. I'm also curious what he thinks about the big Figma deal, Adobe buying Figma for right. $20 billion in the middle of a downturn. And it'll be interesting to get his thoughts given Salesforce bought Slack for $27 billion, which I believe was the biggest tech deal ever at the time. Um, and, 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 and certainly will be interesting <laughs> to get his thoughts as the Fed continues to make these decisions. Yeah, well, he's not a guy that's short of opinions, Em, is he? I mean, let's be honest, he's got an no. opinion on everything, but he's no stranger <laughs> to M&A either, not just that deal that you mentioned. But I think back to MuleSoft, right? And actually, Salesforce gone a little bit quiet in recent weeks and months. You and I used to cover them quite a lot pre-pandemic period and during the, during the pandemic period because this is obviously a company that has decent sales but also is a really high margin business. And at the same time, Benioff is a man of many passion projects, and I'm sure you'll discuss those with him too. Absolutely. It's going to be a great one uh, coming up on Thursday's show. Ed, thank you. Meantime, as Climate Week is in full swing in New York, California Governor Gavin Newsom spoke about the state's climate challenges and how to avoid blackouts like those we've seen in past years here in the state. He spoke with my colleague David Weston from the sidelines of United Nations Climate Action Race to Zero and the Resilience Forum supported by Bloomberg Philanthropies. Take a listen. We were just stress test in the most extreme, had no blackouts. We were challenged, but we kept our wits and we're keeping our agenda and we're maintaining our policy principles that I think will allow us more resilience in the future. So no, I don't think you have to sacrifice one for the other. I would argue not transitioning is the bigger risk and the bigger sacrifice. Transitioning is an important word in that sentence. Yeah. Uh, it's not all of one or all the other, isn't it? Because a lot of experts say, yes, certainly, we have to get to renewables. But you can't just give up, for example, on natural gas, that that is actually part of the path for the transition. Do you agree with that? 100 percent. In fact, we were able to keep the lights on because we kept a lot of our once through cooling plants online. We were able to do backup generators. We are not naive about the situational challenges, but that doesn't mean we don't accelerate. I'll give you an example in areas like battery storage. We have the largest installed battery projects on planet Earth. It was 250 megawatts two and a half years ago, close to 4,000 megawatts. It's our largest power plant today. That's just in two and a half years. Look at what we can do in five, 10, 15 years. So I think people are naively assuming we're not capable of doing so much more with the innovation and entrepreneurial spirit that finds the best of this country. Enormous growth in your battery capacity. You said where you could go. Where do you need to go in order to get to zero well, emissions? I mean, I, look, we have very ambitious goals to carbon neutrality, not net zero, carbon neutrality in 2045. We've established interim goals, 90% of clean energy on our electricity grid by 2035. And of course, we have the 2035 ZEV mandate, which is the most aggressive of any jurisdiction, certainly in the United States, one of the few in the world. So we have to do multiples, probably six gigawatts a year, uh, to move things along. And here's how we do it. It's not just putting unprecedented amount of money to back up these technologies and tax incentives, which we have, $54 billion of new incremental investments, setting the most aggressive policies to get the private sector to invest and fill the gaps. But also the biggest issue that we face in time to project delivery, not just from a supply chain perspective, but permitting perspective, the nimbyism, huge issue. And so we did something profound this year. We have completely 
knocked out all of those barriers and we put in rigid timelines to get projects permitted and go through a judicial process if they're challenged. And that we think is a game changer. Anything I read about this says carbon capture is critical. And I know that's an important part of your strategy. Yeah. At the same time, have we really taken carbon capture to scale, uh, to the scale you need it to be, particularly out of the air? Yeah, not yet. We have direct air capture, a number of companies in California. In fact, they're demonstrating that in Wyoming as we speak. We worked with the oil industry. You'd never believe that since they just did a referendum uh, against our efforts uh, on our setbacks, health and safety setbacks. But no, carbon capture, sequestration, we want to invest in that. And by the way, that's an important point you're making. We were able to find some balance in that space. A few years ago, our environmental justice community, others were like, no, we don't want to have that conversation. Green hydrogen, didn't even want that conversation. So we've been accelerating on all fronts, recognizing we need to de-risk, including, by the way, extending the life of our nuclear plant for five years in order to stress test this grid as we transition and de-risk and look at the issue of cost, which is profoundly important. California Governor Gavin Newsom there with Bloomberg's David Weston. Some other stories we're watching. India is wooing chip makers to the country under a new $10 billion plan. The government will increase financial incentives for manufacturers, upwards of 50 percent of a project's total cost. India is the world's second biggest mobile phone maker. And Warner Music is tapping a YouTube veteran to head the world's third largest record label, Robert Kinkle will become co-CEO in January and sole CEO in February. Kinkle has spent the bulk of his career at YouTube, where he led creative and commercial partnerships and helped launch a subscription service. He was also part of the team at Netflix that introduced original streaming programming. And Beyond Meat has suspended Chief Operating Officer Doug Ramsey. He was arrested on charges that he bit a man's nose during a fight after a college football game in Arkansas. This is another blow for the plant-based protein company, which cut its revenue forecast last month. Coming up, how Latin America's digital economy has bounced back post-pandemic in a bigger way than the United States. Investor Hugo Barra joins us next to tell us more. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. When it comes to the digital revolution, Latin America is catching up fast. The venture capital firm Atlantico, which backs pre-scale Latin American companies, just published a report showing how the digital economy in that part of the world has skyrocketed as a result of the pandemic. Let's dive deeper into all of this with Atlantico venture partner Hugo Barra. He was also vice president of product for Android at Google. Uh, worked at Xiaomi, at Facebook as well. Uh, Hugo, you've worn so many hats, um, so your perspective is really valuable. What are some key highlights uh, that you learned from this report about the Latin American digital economy? I'm curious what surprised you. Hi, Emily. Uh, nice to see you. There's uh, definitely a lot to unpack. Um, in this um, report that we just published yesterday, uh, probably the, the, the key story, the big headline um, which sort of underlines um, investing is that the the the, the pandemic tech boom um, has been sticky in Latin America, and this is a huge deal because in the U.S. we saw uh, a bit of a reversal of the historical trend, um, you know, or back to the historical trend in in tech, uh, whereas in Latin America, particularly in Brazil, we we seem to have sort of jumped ahead. Uh, Brazil e-commerce, for instance, 
is three years sort of ahead of the plan. Uh, you know, that, that sort of growth curve has sh shifted up three years. Um, and, and that obviously has driven a tremendous amount of activity and acceleration in tech there. And there are some, some pretty uh, interesting and borderline absurd um, stats uh, that I think are worth talking about. So one of them, this is sort of part of the e-commerce e uh, branch, if you will, is, is grocery delivery. So groceries delivery in, um, in Brazil uh, as sort of measured by iFood, which is the largest player locally, saw a six times jump, like right at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and then since that, it's grown an extra 10 times, right? So 60 times uh, jump um, between the beginning of the pandemic and now, and that's basically a sustained sort of new level. Um, another big one is telemedicine, which is obviously pretty uh, understandable. But, um, but virtual appointments uh, in Brazil as measured by one of the leading players, a company called Conexa Saúde, uh, 10x in the first year of the pandemic and then doubled uh, hmm. since that, right? So it's like a 20x uh, jump um, from, from the beginning of times. And, and these are sustained new levels, which is really exciting. Interesting. Uh, you know, I'm curious how this is influencing where you and Atlantico are placing your bets because you're learning about these new trends. At the same time, we're going into a massive macroeconomic downturn, and I wonder um, how that's uniquely impacting Latin America. Yeah. So um, I, I think a few things are, are shifting, and I, I would probably look at the, the venture investing scene um, specifically. So. Uh, you know, without a doubt, investment has gone down as compared to what happened in 2021 uh, and, and 2020 um, as a result of sort of this new economic reality. Um, so uh, investments slowed down in Latin America. In, in particular, we've noticed that foreign investors, um, they, they've remained active in the region, but they're pulling back a little. But what's happened is that the local funds are sort of making up the difference, right? And, and this is directly in response uh, to this sort of uh, lasting tech boom um, post-pandemic. It's sort of the, the excitement remains, if you will. So valuations have gone down, um, but investment, particularly in earlier stage companies, uh, you know, continues. There's a few other unique things happening that I think are going to continue to fuel investment in a big way. You know, fintech in LATAM is extremely well developed, uh, I would argue, in some ways much more than in North America. Uh, there's a couple of examples worth mentioning. You know, first off, uh, we saw uh, you know one of the most uh, successful fintech companies, uh, the largest neo bank in the world, New Bank, go public recently. Uh, that's you know a, a world class story. And there's another stat that I I think also relates to to the investment climate, which is what's happening with mobile payments uh, in in Brazil, uh, and and it's it's a it's a skyrocketing example. So the the central bank launched, launched these sort of new instant payment rails a couple of years ago. It's called PIX. Uh, and PIX is, in some ways, very similar to UPI in India, which everybody talks about. But, but what happened in Brazil that was interesting and different is PIX got to a billion transactions per month in just under a year, mm -hmm. which was a quarter of the time it took UPI to get to that same billion a month you know, transaction level in China, in, uh, forgive me, in India. And India has six times the population of Brazil, right? So that changes consumer uh, habits. It, it makes it a lot easier for e-commerce and, you know, and offline to online, online to offline um, sort of uh, patterns to play out. So that has affected the rate at which uh, uh, the, the fintech sector is growing, and it also affects investing in fintech specifically. You know, given that you've worked at so many big tech companies and you were more recently the head of virtual reality at Facebook, now Meta, you know, we've seen this big shift in the public markets. Um, investors seem to be really skeptical, skeptical about this whole metaverse thing. Facebook's market cap is now one sixth of Apple's. And I know it was a very different story when you worked there. Do you think this whole metaverse pivot was the right call? for Mark Zuckerberg? Um, it's a obviously hugely important question. And um, I am biased because I uh, do uh, believe that virtual and augmented reality are really uh, 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 in the future as sort of the next major competing paradigm. Um, so I, I think it was the right call. I think the rate of investment um, you know, is, I think, where we could spend some time debating. You know, should it have been half of the investment 
uh, level, for example, that it's been so far. Um, but, but I have no doubt, because kind of history has, has kept us um, you know, objective here, that we, uh, as a society, are going to go through a competing paradigm shift in the next you know, 10 to 15 years. Um, and uh, the companies that have made the early investments uh, you know, in, in, in the platforms, in some of the core technologies, are going to be the ones you know, that have you know, the, the winning horses in the next major platform race. And, and the, the thing about Meta is that Meta, uh, you know, is starting from much further behind than you know Google or Apple because they don't have sort of a, an operating system, a major platform investment in the current computing paradigm, which is mobile and sort of the smartphone economy. Um, so it, it does require, to a reasonable degree, a disproportional amount of investment. Like I said, I think the you can debate the rate of investment, but I think um, uh, you know strategically thinking twenty years forward. Um, I, I think this will have been the right call. And, you know, more broad, you've worked in so many different markets, you know, China, India, you know, now your focus is on Latin America. And I know, of course, um, you were closer to Latin America earlier in your career. You know, there's a lot of concern about the global economy. There's a lot of concerns about the smartphone market in particular. There's a new iPhone out. Do you think people are going to upgrade right now when they're paying so much more for literally everything from gas to groceries? Are you concerned about the health of the smartphone market? Um, I, I, I am and I have been for a couple of years because I think the industry has a sort of run out of things to, to, to do, you know, have sort of run out of innovation space. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of dying for, uh, you know, uh, Google and, and Apple to jump on the folding, you know, folding phone uh, bandwagon because I think um, that sort of unlocks um, potential with a new form factor. Um, so I think uh, there's a interesting pretty high risk that we're going to see stagnation, <laughs> as you said, in terms of upgrades for the next couple of years until we see the next major wave of innovation. Um, and so, yes, concerned and watching it closely. So you think the next iPhone should be foldable if they want to sell more of them. Is that what you're saying? I, I think that there is a humongous uh, amount of potential if you explore new form factors. And I think foldables um, have a lot of promise. I'm, I, I'm obviously happy that Samsung has led the way here, um, but we need to see everybody else, uh, and particularly sort of Apple's creative eye jumping on board, I think, to, to, to make that work. Um, so fingers crossed. All right. Uh, um, that was an unexpected insight, Hugo. Um, appreciate it. Um, and thank you for bringing us those new numbers from Latin America, Atlantico Partner, and also the CEO of Detect, Hugo Barra. Good to have you back. All right, coming up, the Tezos co-founder on the Ethereum merge and what it means for her blockchain, which is about to get an upgrade of its own. This is Bloomberg. There will be another big upgrade for blockchain. The Tezos Protocol, a proof of stake network widely considered a direct competitor of Ethereum, will undergo its 11th upgrade. Joining me now, Kathleen Brightman, co founder of Tezos. So, Kathleen, how will your upgrade be different from the Ethereum merge? Oh, um, well, fundamentally, uh, Tezos is a cryptocurrency that has a formal mechanism um, for. Uh, proposing and ratifying upgrades to the protocol, meaning um, upgrades happen seamlessly and without the use of a hard fork, uh, which is you know why the Ethereum merge took so long. Uh, it was basically like, in their own words, hurting cats. Um, uh, with Tezos, the reason it's been able to upgrade 10 times largely seamlessly um, is because basically the blockchain was made with um, upgrading itself in mind. Uh, so there's a formal mechanism that makes this process um, pretty straightforward and pretty seamless. So um, 10th time, 11th, hopefully hitting this Friday. Um, 
what kind of technical issues are you preparing for? Um, and I wonder if perhaps none, because there was all this concern about the Ethereum merge and whether it would go off as planned, and it seems to have been kind of a non-event. Yeah, um, I think this has been an excellent uh, marketing effort on behalf half of uh, Ethereum's most vocal promoters uh, to make this into a big kerfuffle. Um, but actually, if you if you prepare uh, these things, uh, they, they tend to go quite smoothly. And, uh, you know, maybe they'll learn that on their third or fourth time that they upgrade. Are, how substantial are your upgrades compared to the Ethereum merge, given that you've done this 10 times? Um, yeah, so I mean, one of the benefits of Tezos uh, as kind of a philosophy and a way of approaching um, innovation is that when you have uh, when you have upgrades that happen on a pretty regular cadence or can be proposed on a pretty regular cadence, you don't have to um, to use consulting speak, boil the ocean in one go. Um, and so these types of things can happen um, piecemeal. Uh, what I mean to say is, you know, the Tezos consensus algorithm has been changed um, wholesale twice, um, and uh, and has also had a number of different improvements that have itched towards um, scaling, which I think is going to be the next big challenge um, for any blockchain, uh, you know, including Ethereum, of course. Um, but yeah, a lot of these networks don't uh, scale very well, meaning they can't handle a lot of the transactions, which is why you see different things like um, congestion and, and fees rising because the cost of um, you know going on the blockchain and having computation there is it gets higher as more people use it. Um, so scaling and having an approach to scaling uh, is something that we've incorporated in the last two upgrades with Tesla. This and indeed Kathmandu, the, the one that's hitting on Friday, um, introduces some, some concepts and some uh, technical capabilities that uh, lean towards having a lot more people use the blockchain. Now, it is Climate Week, and we've been talking a lot about crypto's energy problems. How much energy does uh, Tezos use, and how have you been working to combat its carbon footprint? Yeah, so the Tezos blockchain has been proof of stake uh, since 2018, meaning, well, uh, it was launched with proof of stake, uh, which has a lot less energy um, usage and a lot smaller carbon footprint um, than proof of work networks, uh, such as Bitcoin, most notably. Um, Ethereum transition, of course, the proof of stake um, with with uh, their merge. Um, and so I think that's been a huge relief because I think it's it's been... Um, uh, a, a fact about the industry, which has antagonized a lot of people who would otherwise be neutral, um, you know, this idea of, well, geez, why are you using uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of energy to secure your um, pretend internet money that just seems wasteful? Um, and hopefully, with Ethereum's um, transition to proof of stake, uh, that part of the conversation at least starts to um, dissipate, and we can focus on more interesting questions about uh, the cryptocurrency space. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll be watching out for your 11th upgrade soon. Tezos co-founder Kathleen Brightman. Uh, always good to have you, Kathleen. Thanks for stopping by. We're going to be right back. This is Bloomberg. Jesse Powell, the outspoken and controversial co-founder of the crypto exchange Kraken, is stepping down as CEO. Powell is known for his bold predictions about the future of crypto, some of them right here on our show. Uh, he's also encouraged any, quote, woke employees at Kraken who don't align with the company's culture and values to leave. Uh, he's going to be replaced in coming months by COO David Ripley. He'll become the company's chair. Uh, and this is the first interview since the announcement outgoing CEO of Cracking, Jesse Powell, with us now. So, Jesse, how did you come to this decision? Stepping up, not down, as you say. Yeah, I like to think of it as, you know, I'm taking a higher level role at the chairman level. Uh, you know, I have ultimate oversight over the whole company. Um, Dave Ripley will be doing all the hard work for me, so appreciate that. Thanks, Dave. Um, so, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm excited for this next chapter. I'm extremely confident in David Ripley and his ability to, to lead this company. You know, he's been with us since we were 50 people six years ago, uh, all the way up to, you know, mid 3000s right now. Um, so, you know, he's seen it all. And uh, I'm, I'm just super glad that we have such a deep bench and someone able to, to step up from the inside. Uh, and, you know, we, we came back around to David after running an external search and talking to over a dozen other people. And, you know, he's still clearly the front runner after all that. So I think it's in really great hands and, and I'll still be actively involved uh, day to day 
hopefully this will give me more time to go deeper on the product and, and user experiences, which is what I, re I really enjoy doing. Now, obviously, we're in the middle of a massive, broader market downturn. It's definitely bleeding into crypto. Uh, Kraken's market share, according to some estimates, has shrunk by a third. Um, did that play at all into your uh, moving aside up, uh, stepping up, as you say, at this time? Definitely not. This is something we've been thinking about for over a year. Um, you know, it's a long time coming. I just felt like the time was right with the company being in a very good position right now in terms of our culture, our engagement of our employees. You know, so after the jet ski program, which you mentioned, uh, and all the woke employees left, you know, we ran a survey internally, and people are happier and more engaged and more satisfied than ever. So uh, I think the company's in a great spot. We've we've recently aligned on our five year strategy. Um, so it's just it's just a good time for me to step away, um, you know, after planning this for a long time. Uh, of course, there'll be a transition period. You know, we're, we're looking to hire a new COO to backfill Dave. Uh, so there'll be a bit of a handoff period. Um, but, you know, every, everything's great. You know, I, I hate to go out at, at the bottom of the market. You know, I mean, Dave's performance <laughs> is going to look amazing when things bounce back. And, and I won't get credit for that. But, um, you know, there's never there's never a perfect time. So let's go back to those woke employees, as you called them. Of course, this was very controversial at the time that you said it. And I'm curious if you faced any backlash or you're worried about facing any backlash in your future endeavors. Not at all. Actually, you know, after that whole thing happened, uh, we had a tremendous amount of support come in, record-breaking numbers uh, of uh, job applications coming in. And, you know, I think a lot of people were just waiting for somebody to say it, and they're looking for a place where, where they can be themselves and not have to walk on eggshells. And, uh, you know, they're looking for a place where they can just get to work and work on important things and not be distracted by, you know, little petty uh, grievances that people have. And so, you know, I, I think it actually attracts people and, and deters the wrong kind of people that, you know, are really not cut out to be working in a professional environment. Now... Jamie Dimon just had this to say about crypto. Take a quick listen. Yeah, I'm a major skeptic on crypto tokens, which you call currency, like Bitcoin. They are decentralized Ponzi schemes. Decentralized Ponzi schemes. What's your reaction to that? Uh, I feel like it's better than the centralized Ponzi scheme, which is the stock market and uh, <laughs> national currencies. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's an upgrade, right? We should be asking the question, is it, an, is it an improvement? You know, you can point out problems with anything. And the question really is, is it not perfect, but is it an improvement over the existing system? And crypto helps a tremendous number of people in the world. There are tons of unbanked people in the world. It might be hard for Jamie Dimon to understand that running a bank in the United States, but there are people, billions of people all over the world that don't have bank accounts or access to financial services. And crypto is a real lifeline to those people. Now, I have to revisit some of your predictions that you made right here. One Bitcoin per Lambo, I believe you said, you know, to the moon, infinity and beyond. You know, it hasn't gotten there. And how do you reflect on that? And do you think it still will get there? And, and it, you know, just how much farther off is 100,000? I do think we'll get there. I, I look at this rainbow chart for Bitcoin. You know, we're at the bottom. We're at the, you know, extreme buy territory right now. Um, I bought in again at 18,000. You know, I'm still very long-term bullish. Uh, I still haven't sold a share of my Kraken stock in 11 years. I'm extremely bullish on the company. I'm extremely <laughs> bullish on crypto. Uh, I continue to to hold. Um, so, you know, I think the the fundamentals just keep getting stronger for crypto. Uh, the user adoption keeps growing. The networks get more secure. You know, we keep proving that we can do these upgrades to to these networks uh, in a secure, uh, you know, orderly fashion. And so everything just keeps looking better over time. You know, I think the macro environment's playing a big role in, in what's happening with crypto now. You know, people don't know if they're gonna be able to afford gas or groceries next week. So that certainly affects uh, one's discretionary income or, you know, ability to invest long-term. Uh, but, you know, aside from the speculative value of, of crypto, you know, again, it's, it's solving real problems for people. It does have a functional use case in, in many parts of the world. Um, and so, you know, I think we should look at it more from that perspective. Like, what, what is the goodwill that this is doing? Can we measure this value that, that crypto brings to the world uh, by some other means besides like the, the financial value, you know, the appreciation of the asset? But, you know, what problems is it really solving for people?
All right, so one Lambo, maybe someday, not sure when, uh, but still gonna happen according to you. Um, Jesse Powell, outgoing CEO of Kraken, um, will be watching you in your chairman role um, and whatever else you do next, thank you for joining us. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Coming up Thursday, I'll be interviewing Mark Benioff at Dreamforce, the sales, Salesforce co-CEO, and I will be with you live and also the CEO of Impossible Foods as well. This is Bloomberg.